Welcome to my presentation for the Global Forum on Nicotine 2023 panel, Science, Regulation and Morality. These are my disclosures, and I would like to acknowledge Dr. Carl Phillips, who collaborated on a paper this talk is based on. In this video, I present a holistic model for understanding the multiple and interdependent motivations underpinning actions aimed at prohibiting access to and use of risk-reduced tobacco and nicotine products and actions to deter tobacco harm reduction approaches to reducing smoking. Why do so many health professionals and academics want to stop people who smoke from using one of the most effective and low-risk ways to stop smoking? Common answers suggest anti-tobacco harm reduction is motivated by moral-based beliefs such as using any tobacco or nicotine product is bad or wrong. But beliefs about what behaviours are morally right or wrong are just one driver of anti-harm reduction ideology. Before presenting the model, I'd like you to think about human historical development from living as small extended family groups. For greater protection from attacks, these small groups joined with others and formed tribes. Tribes formed to create societies, nations. They formed alliances to collaborate with other nations and agreed to protect each other if either should come under attack. Beliefs, myths, laws, religions, bodies of knowledge were created to control members of society. So they would work together towards goals for the common good. Firstly, to survive. Secondly, to gain access to more resources to grow and protect their community from threats. There is power in numbers. The different societies, however, did not all have the same belief systems, ideologies. For example, one tribe strongly believed that no one should seek to experience an intoxicated state for whatever reason. They created laws banning such behaviours. They told their members to stop, to, for example, quit or die. And in the past, death was sometimes the punishment for disobeying. Another tribe thought it was OK. Perhaps they discovered some benefit that helped them to survive, thrive and outstrip the competition. These opposing differences in ideology can lead to war, especially when one group believes everyone should adopt their ideology because they are right and what they believe would be best for the world. Other wars are simply about stealing resources from another tribe. There are multiple motivations for why tribes fight. This polyspheric model integrates various motivations. This can be helpful for understanding in a more holistic way the polarization between the quit or die tribe and the harm reduction tribe. Each sphere or layer division is unique, but they operate at the same time, each with its own purpose. Herbert Richardson, a Western theologian, proposed the model. It's a metaphor of overlapping spheres for visualising the interaction of the different realms of motivations. The social or group forming sphere explains that every act affirms or disaffirms the social relations that contribute to forming and reaffirming a group's character. This takes the explanation for particular moral motives beyond the individual realm. Individual behaviours are not just about the person acting within the rules. Anti-harm reduction behaviours are not just about the moral disgust one commentator feels. An individual who defies the rules of the group explained by Sphere 3, for example by vaping, is seen as a threat to the character of the group. When a person acts contrary to a group's rules, the group moves to exclude them. One example is how prohibitionists defame, blacklist and cancel harm reduction advocates. They see people who smoke or vape as a threat to the character of the society they are trying to form or reform. The spiritual sphere pertains to our individual character. 
individual character is a product of how individual motivations, goodness, are acted out in the other spheres. Individual character is central to much Western discourse about morals, so much so that the term morals often triggers people to only think about individual character. Anti-harm reduction behaviours, particularly those that harm consumers, are sometimes motivated by feelings that anyone who consumes risk-reduced products ipso facto has poor individual character. The disdain quit or die prohibitionists feel for these poor spiritual character addicts amplifies the intensity of their motivation to harm consumers of tobacco and nicotine. The rule forming sphere is about the rules, law or regulations developed by the group to maintain order. Rules set the boundaries of what human actions are acceptable and believed to rationally contribute to society's goals. Members of the group are free to act within those boundaries. This rule forming concept is consistent with part of the anti-harm reduction morals story. Choosing to consume tobacco products is spun as being about addiction or getting manipulated by industry marketing. Being addicted or sucked in by industry is equated to being in a fallen state, unfree, possessed and thus dangerous to the group because we don't know what these people will do next. Rule based motivations simultaneously attempt to enforce rules and they contribute to forming the rules. The linguistic or meaning forming sphere explains that all acts are significative statements because people do what they think is right. Actions thus inherently constitute moral assertions and represent moral character. This helps explain the jump from merely disliking vaping or other consumption choices to feeling justified in discrediting, banning or otherwise restricting vaping. Vaping is not seen as just an individual's personal choice of what to do with their body, but a statement that the behaviour is right to do. For someone who believes that smoking or vaping violates the group's norms or is a threat to the character of their ideal society, the private choice to vape becomes a public political act and this motivates prohibitionists to feel duty bound to denormalize vaping, push vaping out of sight, stop and punish such acts. Of course, their bans are also significative. They make a statement about what is right and what is deviant. This motivates the never ending lobbying for interventionist policies even if they are ineffective, poorly prioritised and economically self-defeating. Prohibitionists will never stop proposing new anti-smoking or anti-harm reduction policies and campaigns as long as there are people doing what to them is wrong. They feel the need to repeatedly signal what to them is right. The economic or event forming sphere is about the formation of facts and setting goals. For example, a goal might be to discourage uptake of vaping out of a fear of long term health risks to teenagers or a desire to protect cigarette tax revenue. Worldly debate that is informed by science, whether legitimate or pseudo, exists almost entirely in this sphere. This includes most health science questions such as what does the science say is best practice and policy analysis. Will the proposed actions further the goal and what other effects will they have? These questions might be answered incorrectly, perhaps intentionally, in an attempt to rationalise other motives, but they are assumed to be the first line legitimate motives for action in the Western context. The judgment forming sphere is the realm where we seek to achieve harmony or balance across possibly contradictory motives created by the other spheres. Anti-harm reduction fundamentalists experience very little contradiction. All their motives align. People who do not let their motivations about tobacco product use trump considerations about human rights, 
and welfare likely do experience some contradictions. For example, someone may wish to reduce health risk motivated by the event forming sphere, but still value individual bodily autonomy as an important aspect of the freedom space in accordance with the rule forming and group forming spheres. So one debate we have is about balancing technical methods for reducing harm versus the harms inflicted by, for example, prohibition policies. Some people who support low risk product substitution while opposing harm reduction more generally will join the discussion about this judgment forming. But people who oppose all aspects of tobacco harm reduction will seldom engage. To them, the very acceptance of the terms of this debate signifies blasphemy and represents a rule violation. This leads them to demand that all those in the debate be excluded from proper society. Anti-harm reduction activist discourse is dominated by those who believe that ridding the world of tobacco use trumps all other rule forming concerns. Conversely, for example, consumers believe it is yet another arbitrary and venal effort by those in power to ignore their preferences and quash their freedom. There is nothing to balance for either of those groups. The total war attitude demonstrated by anti-tobacco harm reduction activism means that the moral wisdom of each particular act, such as banning vaping despite social norms against prohibiting personal choices, as compared to some specific alternative, is not addressed. The process is about winning the particular battle. Once there is no room for compromise with the enemy, in the view of one faction, there will be no compromises, discussion or balance, and so the judgment forming sphere is mute. In conclusion, this model provides insight into till now overlooked motivations underpinning the anti-harm reduction war on nicotine. We need to understand this phenomenon more completely to find ways to protect the consumers who are being harmed. Please email me if you would like to read the draft paper. Comments would be welcome. Thank you.